Today, the latest update from New Zealand. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian and New Zealand flavour. Today I'm joined again by Joe Wilkes, the guy on the ground. Hello, Joe. Good morning. Good morning, Martin. I'm not not so much on the ground today. I'm uh, in the uh, in the comfort of my living room. So um, yeah, no no rain to contend with. Quite a nice, bright, sunny day out there today. <laughs> Very good. Well, you're still on the ground in New Zealand, so exactly, yeah, that yeah, still still, still here, works still for me. <laughs> yeah, I, have, I haven't been driven out of the country yet. Okay. Well, we'll keep, we'll keep an eye. If you get deported, we'll know why. Yeah. Now, there's been a really, really interesting series of developments over the last literally few weeks, right? So I thought it would be good to perhaps go through some of those developments and uh, try and give people an update on the narrative and what's happening and perhaps some predictions then about what may happen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's, uh, there's lots to cover. And I mean, we've, we've, we've been working together for the last uh, three or four weeks now. And um, uh, it's come at a time where there, there's some big, big changes going on in the New Zealand economy. Um, well, to be fair, the world economy. Uh, I woke up this morning to a big, big stock market crash in Europe, um, America, um, 3% down in the, the European bourses and uh, America suffered. Um, Shanghai was down overnight, so things are things are changing on the sort of global perspective. But we've got a lot of um, very interesting things happening on a New Zealand perspective, which still aren't being reported on. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, it, it's in, important information for us to share what's going on behind the scenes, so that people can make their decisions on on the ground and and, and their big life decisions for for uh, you know buying houses, moving houses, um, investing in things, um, and uh, more information we can provide. Hopefully, people. People have that clarity to make the right decision. And I think very important is joining the dots, right? Because effectively there are a number of different pieces of information and evidence which may be reported you know, in silos, but when you actually start putting them together, then you get rather a different perspective. Very much so, very much so. I, I think we're, we're starting to see the consequences of the foreign buyer ban um, coming through and, and that removal of liquidity that we talked about on the More From New Zealand post uh, that we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, you, you, you take out a huge source of, of funding into a marketplace and, and, and this funding, whether it's um, Chinese debt funding, whether it's uh, European money, wherever it's coming from, um, it means that there is a, a massive amount of liquidity that has just disappeared from the market. Uh, I don't think it's completely disappeared yet, and I think the legislation will take time to go through. We've still got quite a lot to do on um, anti-money laundering regulations, uh, which come into effect in New Zealand on the 1st of January. Um, and these are regulations that have existed. I, I worked um, uh, and, and we had to uh, uh, sort of carry out anti-money laundering regulations in the UK from 2014. So this is something that we're catching up on down in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, if you look at the the foreign buyer perspective, it's, it's been really interesting this morning. Um, I've heard that there are four major apartment developments in Auckland um, that have all applied to the Overseas Investment Office to uh, relax their specific um, uh, ban on, on foreign foreign investment. Um, this is five weeks after the after the. Foreign has come in so immediately it's, it's suggesting to me okay so with the narrative that we talked about the weekend housing shortage is it really there's a lot of development going on um but it appears that these developments are are um, struggling to find suitable buyers probably at the the level that the developers can justify the previous land acquisition the development cost and and, and making a profit um you know the country has voted voted for a control over over this foreign investment um, and already we're seeing um, the liquidity issues I think present themselves in the construction sector. Yeah it's interesting because we've had uh, tighter controls here m more around um, higher fees and things uh, but of course that's coupled also with uh, harder it's harder for Chinese people, to, for example, to bring money into Australia as well. So the same reactions here. In fact, we, we're seeing a lot of people uh, with uh, uh, portfolios of development uh, uh, properties now having to discount deeply to try and get anybody to, to buy them. And in fact, the banking valuations that are coming in. So if somebody gets a mortgage and you know off the plan, as it were, when it comes to actually uh, finalising the deal, the values are now 15% lower. So that really blows a hole in the water in terms of the economics of the construction sector. Yeah, well, I think we, we suffer possibly even more than that in that I, 
I think a lot of these sites, they very much rely on these pre-sales um, to, to fund the construction. Um, you know, it, again, it's a, it's a, uh, the bank's not taking the risks on, on actually funding whole projects. They're part funding and they rely on these pre-sales to, to provide the next stage development, development funding. Um, without those pre-sales, then uh, my concern is that we, we may see large swathes of, of development just stop. Um, I don't know. I don't think that was what we were seeing in in uh, the Bay of Plenty at the weekend. But uh, you could well find that there are sites where uh, in in Auckland the cranes disappear and, and and things just don't happen. So already the the development sector is is trying to exert pressure on the overseas and in, uh, investment office to try and um, sort of relax relax the legislation to 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 get these things sold. Um, hmm. What needs to happen is that the credit credit markets need to uh, to, to to re- rebase themselves, so that and the market needs to rebase itself, so that these things can can go on uh, in in an environment where Kiwis can actually buy them. Okay, yeah, very interesting. And uh, the the thing about the current level of pricing, right? If if it's basically based on significant overseas demand to 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 lift prices higher, then when that's taken away. Prices can only go one way, can't they? Yeah, I saw it in um, 2006, six, seven in the UK. Um, we had a, a big development boom in the area that I was working in. There were a lot of developers who'd done very well 2001 all the way through to 2007, where the lending was easy. Um, and they were, you know, it even got to the point that we were knocking down existing houses and building bigger houses on, on sites. And there were a, a few developers who got who were very, very successful. Um, they had a business model where they were maybe producing, you know, not not massive scale developments, but they were producing five or six houses a year and and, and turning some very good profits when the credit was easy. Um, and then in 2006, seven, they made, I guess, on confidence, big acquisitions of of large parcels of land where they they were uh, anticipating doing the same thing, paid quite high prices for that land. Uh, and then in 2008 through to 2010, while they were developing and actually getting these things done, um, they were having to sell into a market where the, the buyers weren't getting the access to, to the same amount of credit. Um, and as a result, the profits disappeared. Um, and many of them, many of them really, really, really did, did struggle. So it, it's the it's a consequence of, of uh, overconfidence in a in a market that the expectation is always going to go up that the credit um, availability is always going to go up um, and, and exponentially and um, it, it just leaves leaves these companies exposed when there's any change in the credit environment and you know we were talking the other day about the um, the RBNZ um, and I was <laughs> I was quite shocked that they were doing it and it was really interesting on, on our last discussion they you know I'll sorry discussion before last they're talking about well we're going to relax the lending to, to first-time buyers we're going to allow a higher proportion of low deposit lending by the banks, um, and I was thinking, well, you know, we've already got a major situation. We've got 43 percent of, of mortgages lent last year at five times household income and beyond, um, 25 percent at six times household income and beyond. I was a bit bit um, concerned that, that that was being allowed to continue, um, and then the following day, um, well, you you saw it. <laughs> Yeah, so your uh, your governor basically put a big speech out, right, and uh, was arguing essentially that uh, providing the banks have sufficient capital, essentially everything's fine. You know, we can go on lending forever, basically. Yeah, well, um, it, it seemed like that, and 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 but he's, you know, in one one part you're you're saying, well, we can we can keep going, and we'll we'll let make it easier for for people to prop this market up. Um, and then the following day, there was a speech made where he's um, tightening the regulations for all the all the banks and saying, well, actually, no, we want the banks to hold higher levels of liquidity um, so their capital ratios are stronger and providing a bigger buffer. The two things don't work. You can't have a bank, um, on one hand, go and lend more money to, to more people will make it easier for you. Ah, but we want you to hold more capital um, in the event of, of risk and, and a crisis. So... Um, I can't see that there will actually be that much more lending in the market. Well, and of course, the third element is if, in fact, they have to hold more capital um, at the same time that they're lending more, then effectively that puts the price of uh, of loans up. And um, that's immediately happened. Um, you know, where a few weeks ago we had the foreign buyer ban, um, I was thinking, well, 
remove that liquidity, what's going to happen? The bank's going to have to prop up their existing loan books, so they'll make um, funding cheaper. They lowered, many of them lowered their, their rates below 4%. Um, Governor of the bank makes his speech on Friday. By Friday afternoon, they've all withdrawn their sub-4% uh, rates, and we're now looking at um, one and one and 18-month uh, mortgage money back over 4% again. So um, where... On one thing, you've got a narrative of we're going to we're going to make lending a bit easier for first-time buyers. On the other side, the price of that lending is is looking like it's going to go up if the banks are having to hold more capital. Mm, well, that's absolutely. Uh, and he also, I think, rolled out one very interesting chart, which uh, we'll, we'll show here, which shows the cost of bank failures on society, right? And they actually basically showed it as a percentage cost of the banking system assets, right? And, and, and it's quite horrendous when you look at those numbers because basically what it, what it shows that in a, in a financial crisis, you could easily see 15 or 20 percent of the, the banking system effectively disappearing and needing to be effectively supported, right? Yep. Uh, and that's a huge number. And then he went... And then he went on to say, well, uh, you know, our, our, our primary tool is higher capital to try and actually buttress that. But then, of course, listed a whole bunch of other tools that they also have in their armory, including the bail-in rules, uh, which, of course, is the OBR in, in, in New Zealand, right? And, and, and so he's sort of on one hand arguing that the systemic risks of a banking crisis are really, really dramatic and need to be controlled, and yet the previous day was re <laughs> releasing controls on some of the LVR things. So I'm thinking, which direction is he pointing in? Well, it's, it's difficult. I mean, actually, I think in, in that regard, he's doing a very, very good job, because I think um, if you look at what uh, Mark Carney's done in the UK... Um, he's a, a master of subterfuge and, 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 and saying one thing to, to the markets on one day and then painting a gloomy picture the other day. And it, it hopefully controls people's behavior. Um, but unfortunately, it's not being very well communicated to the general public. So they're not seeing these speeches. They're, they're not being reported on the news. Um, you know, it, it, it just doesn't doesn't appear. There might be a brief episode in, in one of the papers, but it, there's no in-depth analysis of what's going on. So, so, sorry, so just to be clear, so the speech that he gave, a very important speech on Friday, was not reported in, wasn't a, in any of the mainstream media? wasn't reported anywhere. Um, there was a brief, wow. uh, brief reference to it on uh, one, of the local, sorry, one of the national newspapers. Um, didn't make the television. Um, and if you look at the YouTube clip, there's probably, I don't know, I think I'm probably one of a couple of thousand people, if that, who've looked at it. So um, it's very much an inside information um, scenario where the, the general public haven't had the opportunity to go and see exactly what's going on. And in a way that's, I guess, what I find frustrating because these are really big and important issues, right? And whilst the you know, overall narrative out there in, 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 in you know, consumer land is, oh well, everything's fine, keep borrowing, keep buying, um, the real discussion, you know, it's a very has a very different flavour to it, right? Because there are concerns about the risks in the system. There is the need to put more capital uh, into the banking system. Uh, there are discussions about trying to calibrate the risks and, and manage it appropriately. Um, so again, it's it's like we're living in two worlds. Yeah, the uh, GDP is fine. It's growing. Um, there's no reporting on. Uh Last year, uh, $63 billion worth of, of new mortgages were written. Uh, there's no understanding that for the economy to keep growing, we need to write even more mortgages next year, which means finding more first-time buyers. Um, because investors do seem to be walking away from the market at the moment. Um, so we need to find a lot more first-time buyers to take on even more debt to underpin everybody's expectation of, of, of prices. Um, and that, the, you know, when you've got, when you've got, mortgaging mortgages being written at 63 billion and that's not total mortgage lending because there'll be people who redeem their mortgages at the end of the year and um you know so a transaction there will be a redemption but normally a new mortgage written is a bigger mortgage than the one that's being redeemed um, because the, the redemption is normally for somebody who's trading down to be mortgage free at the end of their life um but 63 billion in an economy that's uh just a little over 200 billion dollars uh, is an awful lot of mortgaging and um, so you're, you're talking about almost a third of um of our gdp and new mortgages being written each year um 
I don't think that that's being told in in the mainstream, um, and it should be because uh, people should be well aware that it is we're, we're purely living on a debt funded economy at the moment. Mm. Well, it's it's absolutely fascinating because the the critical concept that we we need to talk about is what we call the credit impulse, right? And that is the rate of credit increase or decrease, right? Because that's the thing you need to look at. Because all the modelling shows that the credit impulse is the thing that's the best forward-leading indicator of future home prices. As the credit impulse increases, in other words, as the rate of lending increases, home prices go up. As the rate of increase turns negative, in other words, declines, you can still grow, but if you start growing more slowly, right, that is sufficient to turn home prices lower. Exactly. And yet I see almost nobody either here in Australia or in New Zealand, talking about the credit impulse, right? And, and why this is important is because there is a, a, a fundamental fallacy at the heart of the way that people think about the banking system, which is that loans are matched to deposits. In other words, we take deposits first and then effectively we can make loans to people. It doesn't work like that, right? It's the other way around, right? So basically, banks have the ability to lend, um, they can tap into funding and do all sorts of things uh, other than just deposits. It is not connected directly to deposits. In fact, deposits follow because effectively when people um, uh, get money from the bank to buy a property or to put in the, into their deposit account, that is creating an asset. But that cr asset creation process, either deposits or, or property, follows lending. Now, this is something that up until a few years ago was really not that well understood. There was a very, very important paper from the um, the Bank of England a few years ago that it's really... It's 2014. Sort of turned, yeah, yeah. To, turned the whole thing on its head and basically said, we're thinking about this wrong, right? Now, if you, if you then put credit impulse and the fact that loans lead deposits together then you can see precisely the challenge that we've got. If you continue to, to allow lending growth to accelerate, home prices will continue to go, and effectively the asset bubble gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and of course the debt burden gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. But the reverse is also true, that effectively if credit starts to get tighter, then effectively home prices start to go the other way because the credit impulse degrades, which is precisely what we're seeing in Australia now. So currently we are seeing um, uh, credit now for, for home prices around the 5% market was sort of 7% you know, earlier on. So we're seeing the credit impulse easing. Home prices are already, already down 9% this year in Sydney, 5 or 6% in Melbourne and in other places too. So you can see immediately the impact of tighter credit, which goes then go back to the conversation in New Zealand, right? What they're concerned about there is clearly is not allowing the credit impulse to degrade. No, they can't afford to, I don't think. I think there's... Um there is still this lack of understanding in, in New Zealand, and, and, and it's something that we, we need to debunk now. Um, if you and I and three other people go and put our money in the bank um, and save, and the bank pays us an interest rate for doing so, um, that money does not, um, that's not what provides the mortgage at the other end. Um, the mortgage gets written and the deposit gets put on the balance sheet um, as, a, as an asset that will be charged interest over 30 years. Um, I saw uh, an interview yesterday with, uh, which was done by a, 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 a financial website in New Zealand, uh, and an interview of, of one of the CEOs of one of the New Zealand banks, where uh, he was talking about uh, lending rates of 4% likely to be a generational low. So there in itself is a signal that, okay, well, these 4% rates aren't going to last forever. So I, I, I genuinely believe that the cost of credit will go up significantly next year. Um, the the thing that astonished me about the interview was that the, the, the questioning um, was uh, around the deposit funding. So people putting money on term deposits and then getting three and a half, three point six percent and that the four percent mortgage rates giving them a point four percent spread was too narrow. So even somebody who is a, a CEO representing a a, a bank in New Zealand, I'm not going to say which one, was allowed to go and publicly put this on air without question from from the um, from the interviewer. So we, we have got we have got some issues, and and, and uh, from my from my perspective, it's not about creating an issue for the banks, but I think it's really important that the the customers and and the people that are borrowing money, lending money to banks, 
are all aware of of how this how this money is created and flows around the system. We have got um, uh, a bail-in legislation in New Zealand. Um, it was written in uh, to law by the previous National Party. Um, I don't think very many people are really aware of what bail-in means, and I'd just like to explain that sort of simply to people. Um, first of all, this is not something that is uh, is just New Zealand's got bail-in and no one else does. Um, Canada's got bail-in. Um, the UK have got bail-in as well, um, which I only found out about recently. They've got bail-in for um, uh, in legislation since 2014. It was snuck through at Christmas, I think, when everybody was asleep. Uh, a couple of years later, New Zealand... Um, they stuck theirs through as well. So the idea is if you actually, so, so, so go back, you know, as we said earlier on, the problem is in a, in, in, in a systemic banking failure, it costs the economy a huge amount. And traditionally that's been the taxpayer who bails out the banks as happened in GFC, right? Now, globally through the financial stability reward and through the G20, they basically said, no, we can't have that. We've got to find an alternative path. And so the alternative path is now to find different ways of dealing with bank failures, right? And, and there's things like making a living will for a bank so they've got a plan if they get into difficulty, higher capital ratios and all those sorts of things. But the bail-in element is a mandated element based on this new global framework that is being rolled out into in, across most countries. And the bail-in basically says certain classes of um, assets um, can be grabbed, right? And, and so, for example, convertible bonds, uh, in other words, people uh, buy bonds in a bank that has the ability to be converted into equity, equity if required, right? That's sort of a recognised form of bail-in. But they also allow deposits, to be bailed in and effectively converted to equity in the bank to be able to actually prop the bank up. So it's meant to try and protect a bank from falling over. Now, if the bank doesn't fall over, the deposit insurance is irrelevant. Absolutely, yeah. And right? but nobody's aware of it over here. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you were to walk, if you walk down, down the street and ask 10,000 people in the course of a day, you might find two people who are aware that this is this is something that... A previous administration has written into law in New Zealand. Um, just, just in terms of the OBR, Open Banking Regulation, right? The Reserve Bank in New Zealand have done a very important thing, which is to actually describe in detail how this process will work. There's a lovely little chart. We'll we'll show the chart here, which shows the journey of, of bank um, uh, rescue. Right? Yes. So basically, what they say is, if a bank gets into difficulty, we have the option of grabbing some of those deposits that are in the bank and using those deposits to help restructure the bank and effectively uh, rescue it. But the net, the downside is you may not get all your deposits back. Right. Now that's a wonderful little picture. Yeah. Quite a scary picture if you think about it. Right. But almost no other country around the world has been so straightforward and transparent about. The bail-in process, right? So, t you know, tick to New Zealand tick, for actually, yeah, that, for, for that actually describing. Definitely. Yeah, it's just that people don't get what it means. But the other interesting thing is that the Reserve Bank in New Zealand has also now started putting up scorecards for each bank on their website, so that people can make an assessment of the relative risks of different banks. Now, that's critical because, in fact, they've already said, you know, Reserve Bank in New Zealand has said it's down to depositors to make a risk assessment as to which banks are more or less risky, yeah. right? because not all banks are the same. That's a remarkable disclosure again. So you've got more disclosure now around the banking system in New Zealand than we have in Australia. In Australia, we have no um, single bank information. We only have aggregated data, so people cannot make a decision. And I'll just tell a little, a little story here. In Australia, the bail-in legislation got snuck in and it's deliberately fuzzy, so no one is completely clear as to whether deposits are or aren't included. And every time you write to your MP about this, they, they answer in terms of the deposit insurance, right? So even MPs are completely confused about the difference between bail-in and deposit insurance, which is in a gone situation. Now, this is a really muddy, messy area. So I, I give a tick to New Zealand for being... Um, more transparent about it and actually telling it as it is but people need to understand that there are risks now vis-a-vis -vis deposits. 
more people need to know about it because these risks are building. I, I'm not expecting the economy to fall over tomorrow, but the risks are building in the system. They're building globally. There could be some big shocks. Um, we've got uh, massive issues in uh, the, the bond market in Europe at the moment. The Italian debt uh, is, is unsustainable. It's only the ECB who are buying their bonds. Uh, we've got various issues that could arise out of Brexit, which I think they're really making a meal of still. Um, I wish that, you know, that this could have been sorted in 10 minutes if you put some proper people in a room. Um, but these risks are building. Um, mm. And what I think that we're, we've got to be very careful of is that our household leverage is so high. Um, we have got a change in, in situation now because the, 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 the foreign liquidity isn't propping, propping up and underpinning it. And nobody knows. That, OK, that's one risk. Um, we've got heavily indebted households already. We have got rising consumer prices. The, the, the press are talking about excellent GDP, um, very, very low unemployment rate. Those are all positive things for now, but they, they, owe, they rely on, on the continuation of the credit impulse. Can I ask you something, Martin? I'm, uh, I'm a little bit confused. We've got um, uh, four major banks, in essence, in, the, in New Zealand. Uh, we have Kiwi Bank, who are Kiwi owned. And we've got a few cooperatives and, and smaller lending institutions. Um, our banks are all parented by Australian banks. Now, I've, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about Australia's impact on New Zealand, and that, that for me is, is, is a really big risk. I, I think we've been uh, very um, uh, relaxed with our banking institutions. I think we've lent, allowed them to lend too much money to too many people. Um, but I'm terrified of the Australian banks. Um, Particularly when you when you see the interviews and, and you, you understand, you know, Westpac in 2017, 50% of their loan book on interest only, the weight of um, interest only mortgages that you have in Australia, um, which are coming up for renewal, and, and that is going to have an, an enormous impact. You know, the price falls have started in in Auckland, uh, sorry, have started in Sydney and Melbourne, and, and 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 they're quite quite significant now, and they're gathering pace. If an Australian bank fails, I don't understand what impact that could have on its subsidiary in New Zealand. If Westpac, for example, or, or run uh, uh, ANZ have major funding issues in, in Australia, what happens to New Zealand people who, you know, if their deposits are set in the, in the subsidiaries? It's a great question, and the short answer is there's very little disclosure about it, but that we, can, we know there's a few pointers. The firstly, the IMF, when they did their last country review, made the comment that New Zealand banking is much more relying and intertwined with Australian banking than is generally recognised, and they recommended that the regulators in New Zealand think about harder, think about the implications of what would happen if, if, if the banking system in Australia started to wobble. Right. So, so, so there's a recognition from an external point of view that that's, a, that's an issue and a risk. The second point is they are subsidiaries, and they are subsidiaries in New Zealand, capitalised in New Zealand on a standalone basis. Yeah. Right. So, so in other words, you're not just using Australian capital to fund the New Zealand business. It, has, it is actually regulated in New Zealand as a standalone entity and is tested as a standalone entity. The problem is that the spillover effect, That's if, for the example, risk. the parent got into difficulty in Australia, it immediately locks liquidity and locks effectively the ability to fund forward. So the question then becomes what proportion of the New Zealand bank's books are funded not from local deposits, but funded from international funding sources? Yeah, right? it seems to be generally around the 20 20% or so. Correct. So, so you'd have to assume that if the Australian end got into difficulty, then the New Zealand bank subsidiaries would have some difficulty in actually getting the liquidity they needed to continue to fund their book. And it's worth looking at the longevity of that funding because quite a lot of the funding is three, five, seven years. But there also will be some at the short end, 90 days is quite yeah. typical. Um, and... Uh, to give you a bit of a flavour of that, in Australia, about, let's say, a third of the bank's funding is on a 90-day running basis, right? Which right. is why they're so impacted by the rising funding rates, if you look at LIBOR, if you look at what's happening in the US, because effectively every 90 days they have to keep funding, that's, that's funding, funding, right? 
Now, I don't know what the mix is in New Zealand. I haven't looked at the statistics. Perhaps I should, but um, um, I suspect that you'll find a rather similar mix. So let's assume a third of that um, 20% is actually on 90-day running, right? Yeah. That means that effectively, quite quickly, liquidity becomes an issue because effectively, if you're not able to refinance and refund um, at all, or worse, at very high rates, yeah. then you've got a significant issue. So it could have pricing issues. It could have stability issues. And that is why the Reserve Bank in New Zealand is talking about holding higher capital, because, of course, if you do hold more capital, then effectively it's the shareholders that take the risk first. Right. But but this whole question of the interconnectedness of the financial system, and it's not, I don't think it's just Australia and New Zealand, although it's a very close yes. connection. Worldwide. It's part of the global financial system. And in fact, a lot of the funding, if I look at the Australian banks, are through the euro markets or through the US markets. So we're completely exposed to any international dynamics, right? Which immediately um, could expose New Zealand. Correct. Yeah. So, so you know, it's hard to... And, and, and I keep saying to people, the regulators should be playing out these scenarios now. They should be thinking about what would happen if, right? How would we handle these sorts of scenarios? Because in a way, having all the toolkit as Adrian Orr said, you know, it's useful. But actually thinking about how these scenarios may play out before they happen is really important because then you actually get to think about, you know, what might and may not work. The trouble is that what I see is people effectively saying, well, you know, we've got toolkits that we could use if we need them, but we leave it at that and then we react once yeah, the crisis hits. Yes, it's about preparing beforehand. I mean, we, we've yeah. got in, in New Zealand... Um, 50% of mortgages come up for renewal. So most mortgages, which are generally long-term obligations, they're up for renewal in, in, the, um, in the next 12 months. That's quite a heavy change if all of a sudden you see a liquidity issue and, and the cost of funding goes up. Uh, that exposes the banks overnight. So it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, an interesting situation. But I don't think there is enough being talked about in the press. I think Reserve Bank have been very good in, in terms of being transparent about, okay, this is where it is. On the news to go and publicise it to the to the people. Yeah, and it's tricky, right? Because what you don't want to do is to create a run on the bank simply by oh, saying yeah, we've got yeah. issues, right? And that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, it's important that people understand the dynamics that are in play and the reality of the situation, right? Exactly. And, and because because then you can make sensible decisions about you know do I take a bigger loan or or whatever or which bank do I actually go with. Because if you, if, if you don't know that, then basically you're going to be blindsided if some of this stuff actually blows up. And as we keep saying, unfortunately, the truth is that the international financial situation is quite wobbly at the moment. Look at the stock market, look at the funding costs, look at some of the other things that are on, going on around the world. So therefore, it, it is only sensible to think about some of these alternatives and talk about some of these alternatives so that people you know, have, have a better sense of, of what's really going on, which is partly is what the DFA channel is all about. We're exactly. trying to actually have something, not, not trying to scare people, but what we're trying to do is to have a more sensible and logical debate about some of the critical issues that we think are facing um, you know, both New Zealand and Australia and other places and individuals as well. So that's why we do what we do. And uh, you're working very hard at it, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's plenty to talk about at the moment. A lot going on. There is indeed. There is indeed. Yeah. So yeah, no, we'll uh, we'll we'll see. I mean, for, from from this end, um, it's just a case of people understanding a little bit more about where the money's coming from. And um, the the Reserve Bank, um, they don't have all the tools in the toolkit. They should have been given uh, some tools a few years ago, in my view. Um, that they should have been allowed to to control the debt to income ratios on lending. Um, that was requested. It wasn't given. Um, it's still not there. I don't think you can deleverage from from the position we are at the moment. You can't go and say, okay, well, um, we're not going to go and we're, you know, we're going to restrict lending to four times household income overnight. You can't do that because that collapses things immediately. But what I do think there should be is a, a, a thought about a gradual process of, of just making sure that we, we, we are caring about the next generation and how much debt they are taking on. Um, the, the press is still encouraging this, the, 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 the bubble, um, and the banks are still lending, as we know, over a quarter of their, their loan book on, on household income debt to income ratios of, of beyond, beyond six. So mm. 
the, the controls need to come in gradually. Um, are the Reserve Bank talking to, we've got um, to Michael Cullen currently putting together regulation around the rental market. We've got some tax laws that may change. We may have capital gains tax changes. Uh, we may have changes to negative gearing. Now, all of these things need to be thought about from a holistic perspective. Um, and, and my concern is that at the moment, um, the conversation is hopefully, hopefully they are taking place. But there's um, uh, if one if one part of you know we've seen this foreign buyer ban come in. And that has immediately changed the liquidity, and, and we've got the, the building sector screaming to the overseas investment office. Um, I, I agree with the foreign buyer ban. I think it's the right thing to do, um, but you can't do everything at one hit at the moment. We, we're going to have to manage this process over a period of years um, to avoid avoid a, a, a you know a situation that could you know irregardless of what's going on in the wider world could present a major issue uh, for you know the communities that that, that I'm living in. Yeah, what we're talking about here is an overall strategy which effectively in the medium term is to get debt under control and to bring it back to more normal, sensible, lower risk um, settings. That That's the strategy. And then you put the various elements below it rather, rather than sort of tackling one thing at a time fires, right? it's, it's, and hoping that magically it's going to sort of work right because and it that's, won't. and that's the yeah. danger in new zealand because the press control this narrative they're, they're you know vested interest are pushing one thing in one direction other people are pushing something in another direction and there's no holistic approach to okay we're all we're already looking at household income that is sorry household debt to income levels which are enormous mm. um now we need to try and work out how we can manage manage through the next few years yeah Tricky, but important and a strategic conversation and perhaps even beyond the political cycle. Right. And that's the other factor that gets in here, because basically people get <laughs> get elected and reelected in short order. And so effectively you see lots of tactical short term policy things rather than long term strategy things. Right. So so I think that there's a, there's there should be, um, if you like, a, a national plan to deal with the debt issue and the home price issue that is actually longer than the political cycle because these things are critical from an intergenerational perspective right we've dug ourselves into a hole over the last 20 years because of this sort of you know debt inflation cycle and the, the credit boom and the debt bomb um, it's time to take a more strategic path in my view and that will be i think pointed directly at australia but also potentially at new zealand as well Exactly. Um, it's opening up the conversation, I think. Thanks, Joe. It's really good to talk to you. Bit of a serious one today, but I think it's a really important conversation. Yeah. No, thank you for, for that. We'll, um, I'll get out on the road, I think, over the next few days. We'll have a bit more fun around, uh, around New Zealand. I can find some more developments to look at and, uh, and, and a few other specific markets. Well, I think it's good because uh, you got huge positive reaction to your last uh, trip out there and you got a bit wet. But uh, I think people really ben benefit and, you know, appreciate the on the ground view. So uh, I think it'll be good to get some more of those uh, in, in, in our next show. So we'll try and do that. I'll see what we can do. If you spot me around um, and I look wet, um, give us a brolly. <laughs> yes, he's the soggy guy. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Take see care, you Martin. Soon. All the best. Bye.